In this session we'll look at a chronological life of Christ and with emphasis on his uh, teaching and his character throughout. First of all, who is Jesus? That really is the crux of the matter. You can't really study Jesus without having some perspective on this. And Jesus queried his disciples and to Simon Peter in Matthew 16, 13 about, about who's, who this, uh, people say the Son of Man is, is really the crux of the matter. All scholars recognize the historical existence of Jesus, even the very liberal scholars from the Jesus Seminar, which is probably the furthest out there in terms of uh, questioning everything about the existence of Jesus, but even they uh, acknowledge that Jesus did exist as a historical figure. And here are some options for interpreting who Jesus was. One is that he was a fake or a fraud. That is, he made claims he knew were not true. He was a liar, in other words. And some Jewish groups hold to this, but not many. Another option is that he was a moral teacher or a religious leader and a lot of groups hold this uh, really it's a suspension of judgment and it's held by people called materialists now this doesn't mean people who seek material goods it means uh, people who believe that the material universe is all that there is in other words when you die you're dead there's nothing beyond the visible world sometimes these are called scientific realists and they would acknowledge that Jesus was a great teacher and religious leader there are also various religious groups that uh, say this. Some would say he's a prophet of God, but not divine, and not God's final revelation. Some Jews hold to this view, and Islam also does. Uh, Muslims will tell you that they believe Jesus is the Messiah, but in saying that uh, what they mean is that Jesus is a prophet. And Hindus see him as one way to salvation. Another view is that he is the Son of God, but not fully divine. Mormons hold to this view that Jesus is a created being, in fact, an angelic being, the brother of Lucifer. Jehovah's Witnesses also hold the view that uh, he, that Jesus is a Son of God, but not fully divine. Uh, Orthodox Christians, which include uh, Roman Catholics, Protestants, Eastern Orthodox, uh, believe that Jesus is God incarnate, that is God in the flesh. He's fully human, fully divine, he's the object of worship, and one on whom our destiny depends. And that central tenet is what defines someone as being a, uh, it is a central pillar, a tenet of the Christian faith. But it's impossible to study Jesus intelligently without having some kind of interpretation concerning who he is. The influence of Jesus, well, that's pretty obvious. Uh, he has an influence on many world religions, on the calendar itself. We have B.C. and A.D. And the very existence of the Christian church around the world says something about the influence of Jesus. Sources for the study of the life of Christ, well, there are extra-biblical sources, and I have provided a handout for you uh, in the folder for this week to take a look at, so I would encourage you to look at some of these early things. The one by Josephus, though, is interesting because in the quote from Josephus, he claims that Jesus is the Messiah. However, Jesus, Josephus was Jewish. There is no uh, indication in his writings that he ever believed that Jesus was the Messiah or that he's equal with God, as uh, Christian groups do. And so it seems that uh, someone who was transcribing what Josephus had to say in Antiquities inserted his claim that Jesus is a Messiah later on. For biblical sources, there are Paul's letters, which are the earliest. And um, actually, he's not giving a detailed account of the life of Christ, but his purpose is in response to Jesus' death and resurrection. In other words, because of what has happened now, uh, here is how the church ought to be formed, and here is how you ought to behave in light of who you are in Christ. And then there are other New Testament writings except the Gospels. But the main documents are the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
Now, why do I see the Gospels as, as historical? Well, uh, one is that the early Christians were careful uh, for uh, writing the Lord's works and words. Um, and also, the cost of writing materials was high. You couldn't go out and buy a ream of paper. It required e either getting papyrus that was, of course, all handmade and was very fragile, or using parchment or vellum, which was animal hide, which was very expensive and timely, time consuming to produce. Um, another is that the writers were in a good position to know the facts about Jesus, and because there were eyewitnesses living at that time who also knew Jesus, who were eyewitnesses of his ministry, they were in a position to correct the early writers if they had been wrong. Uh, another is that through the, the four Gospels, a fundamental picture of Jesus shines through. It is this. He was humble before God and submissive to the authority of God the Father. And yet at the same time, he makes pronouncements as though he has divine authority. He clearly believes this. In that day, it was common for rabbis to refer to the work of other great rabbis when they were teaching. The people were amazed at Jesus' teaching because they say he teaches with authority, and what this means is that he does not refer to anyone because he doesn't need to. He is also dedicated to the Father's purpose, even in the case, even in the, in the, in the face of imminent suffering and death. He knew the hearts of people. In one case, when he was being anointed by a sinful woman, and she was uh, kissing his feet and, and washing them with her tears and wiping his feet with her hair, he knew the heart of Simon, who was revolted that he would let a woman of the street touch him like that. He had a concern for the poor and the needy. And he also had a conviction that God's hour of salvation had come through him. Then there is the reliability of the Bible as a whole and the consistency of its teaching. In addition to that, there is the change in the apostles after the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. After Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, we have the remaining disciples hiding in an upper room and after the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, they were so bold that they proclaimed the gospel and the teaching of Christ to the point that all of them died the death of a martyr except for John. It's, it, it is um, ridiculous to think that these men would have died a martyr's death for something they knew to be false. And then there is a careful preservation of the characteristics and teaching of the Master, of Jesus. Even things that they may have found embarrassing or things they didn't understand. Such as Jesus uh, saying that his second coming, or seeming to say that his second coming was imminent. Or um, his view of animals or of women which were revolutionary for the time. It would have been very easy for the early church to simply have uh, caused those sayings to fall into obscurity, to simply have edited them out, but in fact they don't. Even when they didn't understand them and when they found them embarrassing, they still preserved them. When considering the life of Christ, another major question is what type of Messiah the people thought that he was. In his day, the people primarily considered Jesus to be a political deliverer a political or military deliverer. The Romans were occupying that territory. They were collecting taxes, and the people resented uh, the Romans. In addition to that, they were not granted uh, the rights of a Roman citizen, and so they were mistreated. And so primarily, that was a primary need that they saw was to get rid of the Romans. And they saw Jesus because of his power as someone who could do that. So primarily, even his disciples in his earthly ministry believed that he was a political deliverer, or at least wanted him to be. Later on, the disciples and the early church began to understand that Jesus was really a religious or political deliverer. In other words, he was concerned with more eternal things than just the Roman government. 
He was uh, concerned with delivering people from a religious system whose observance made it impossible to ever please God. So in, he was a spiritual deliverer. Old Testament prophecies point to Jesus. And the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 talks about how the Old Testament prophets pointed to Jesus coming. He says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared by power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Other Old Testament prophecies, well in in uh, Matthew 1.23, Matthew is um, showing that Isaiah 7.14 um, is, is a prophecy that the Messiah would come. And he also uh, uh, refers to Isaiah 43 and Malachi 3.1 in saying that a forerunner would come. This is John the Baptist. His birthplace is prophesied in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And then the purpose of his ministry is outlined in Isaiah 53, 4 and 42, 1 through 4. Um, the, uh, his death is prophesied in Zechariah 13, 7. His resurrection in Psalm 16, 10. And these are all passages the gospel writers refer to, mainly Matthew, to say that Jesus is fulfilling these Old Testament prophecies. First of all, when we talk about the life of Christ, we have to begin with his pre-existence. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, John begins talking about Jesus' pre-existence. In 1 through 5, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and that word is, is capitalized in the English translation, And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Then skip down to 14 through 18. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom... I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And then Colossians 1, 15-18 talks about Jesus being the creator and that uh, the, he's the head of the church and everything that was created that exists was created by him and reality holds together in him. His birth and early years, well, we have the, the genealogies in Matthew and in Luke, but the primary question is why are there two genealogies? Well, Matthew writes, remember, to a Jewish audience, and so he writes from the standpoint of Joseph for Jews. Luke, on the other hand, writes from the standpoint of Mary, because he writes for all people, and he traces uh, Jesus' lineage through Mary, which would be more logical to a Gentile audience. Uh, Matthew looks at 14 generations. Uh, Luke uh, traces Jesus' lineage back to Adam, because he's writing to everyone. Now, uh, Luke records the birth of John the Baptist in uh, 1, 1 through 17, and 5, 57 through 80. Here's the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. There is the announcement to Zechariah by the angel, and then John and um, Jesus, uh, when, when Jesus was born, are actually cousins. That's in Luke 1, 36. Um, I think the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth is funny because of Zechariah being unable to talk until John the Baptist's birth because he did not believe the angel. Birth of 
uh, Jesus in the early years, well, there, there is the announcement to Mary in Luke 1, 26 through 38. Uh, then we have the announcement to Joseph in 1, 18 through 25. Uh, Jesus' birth comes in Luke 2, 1 through 20. His circumcision in Luke 2, 21. And then the presentation of the temple in the temple in Luke 2, uh, 28 through 38. But I, I want to read Luke uh, chapter 2, verses uh, 28 through 35. As soon as I turn there. Hold on. <laughs> Okay. It says, um, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, This is Jesus in the temple, as they're presenting him as a baby. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, you which you prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles, and glory for the people Israel. Um, the child's father and mother marveled at what he said about them, about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. The wise men, um, or the... Um, Come from uh, come in uh, Matthew two one through twelve. The flight to Egypt comes in Matthew two thirteen through twenty three as they flee from um, Herod's uh, paranoia and his killing of the male children in Bethlehem. His youth and his visit to Jerusalem is in Luke two thirty nine and uh, forty through fifty two. As far as his early years, there's a lot of things that we would like to know about Jesus growing up. After all, he had to go through adolescence like everyone else. He had to play with children. Uh, he apparently got a basic education in the synagogue. About all we know is that he was a carpenter's son, and that since Joseph is not mentioned later in Jesus' life, we assume that Joseph died. The year of obscurity in Jesus' ministry, uh, first we have, we begin with the ministry of John the Baptist. Uh, when Eastern or Oriental kings went on a journey, heralds were sent ahead. Uh, any kind of time an important official goes somewhere, uh, the people who are in front of that person make preparations. Um, for instance, uh, I spent many days uh, preparing buildings uh, ahead of a general visiting and, and then uh, the general didn't actually show up because he got to the chow hall and found an old buddy and started talking to him. Uh, when the president goes somewhere, the president of the United States, there are a lot of preparations made before he gets there. This is the same idea. Um, in this case, John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus. The birth of John the Baptist, as uh, told in Luke 1, 13 through 17, basically his ministry excommunicates Israel. Uh, the content of his message is that of repentance. Now, the reason he ex is, uh, was understood in that day to excommunicate Israel is because baptism was for people who were Gentiles and converted to Judaism, that is, proselytes. But what he does, he said that you all need to be baptized. He baptizes Jews. So in doing that, he's saying, I'm excommunicating you all. He was offensive. We see that in his offending Herod Anipas because uh, he was married to his brother's wife while his brother was still living. He clearly does not compromise. He comes to Jesus or Jesus comes to him for baptism. A common question that people ask is, why did the sinless one need baptism? Well, one is that it showed his approval of John the Baptist's ministry. That in other words, he agreed with what he was doing in calling people to repentance. He also does it as an example for others to follow, that others should be baptized as well. Uh, even though he was without sin, it allows him the opportunity to identify with the, uh, the sinners who were being baptized. And baptism symbolizes the gospel. In other words, when a person 
is above the water standing there before they are immersed. It symbolizes their life before following Christ. And when they are submersed, it means that they are they die to their old way of life. They are wrapped up in Christ. When they come out of the water, the symbolism is that they are beginning life anew, following God. Another is that it gives God the Father an opportunity to confirm his messiahship. The next thing that happens in the year of obscurity is the temptation of Jesus. Um, and we've looked at that previously. Um, then he selects the core of disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. And that's in John 40 through 48. Then as we come to his first ministry, which is the beginning of his public ministry, this is in John 2, 1 through 10. Now Jesus was the kind of person, apparently, that people like to be around. He was the kind that was invited to parties, even parties of people who were of ill repute. And he went. And in doing so, he became a message to the Jews that uh, the kingdom of God was imminent in him. And also, uh, to some Gentiles during that time, the Roman centurion being one of those, but eventually to Gentiles everywhere. And I'm happy about that because I'm a Gentile. The next thing that happens is the cleansing of the temple. Maybe this happened twice or maybe once. Most likely, um, I th at least this is my opinion, is that the, the synoptic gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, could only insert this uh, at the end of Jesus' ministry because this is the only time they record him being in Jerusalem for the Passover. Um, and remember we talked about the ancient Near Eastern view that uh, ordering things chronologically was not necessarily essential. Um, and so it would seem that John actually records it chronologically because he talks about earlier trips of Jesus to Jerusalem. The visit with Nicodemus is in John chapter 3, the great teacher of Israel. And then the arrest of John the Baptist is in Matthew 14.3 and in Mark 1.14. And of course we know the end of that sordid tale that John eventually is beheaded. But it seems that John has some points of concern and doubt about whether Jesus is the Messiah himself and uh, sends for word from Jesus, and Jesus confirms that indeed he is the Messiah, and that John the Baptist got it right. It just shows that anybody can be discouraged. His return to Galilee, he meets a woman at the well in John chapter 4, and converses with her, and breaks several barriers of that day. Um, and that day, a uh, man did not talk to a woman in public, certainly not a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman, and even more, a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman who was of bad reputation. His year of popularity begins in uh, Capernaum. Was, was that, that was the focus of his ministry, and his followers begin to increase dramatically. He chooses the twelve. Uh, from them, from his followers, to be his immediate disciples, although there were other people who followed him as well. One of them, among them were John Mark, who wrote the Gospel of Mark. There was a commission at Nazareth in uh, Luke 14, 18 through 21, and here re re is recorded his rejection by his own people. He calls his disciples in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. All of them are Galileans except for Judas and uh, that's also in 6, 12 through 16. They were normal people from all walks of life, commercial fishermen, tax collectors, zealots, and it would be interesting to hear some of the conversations they had with a former tax collector who was seen to be in league with the Roman government, and a zealot who was in favor of the violent overthrow of the Roman government. Um, we can just imagine this would be like an extreme conversation between uh, Democrats and Republicans. It probably at points deteriorated into a shouting match, maybe even fist fights. I don't know. Uh, there are discrepancies between Luke 16, 14 through 16 and Matthew 10, 1 through 4. Uh, one of the explanations for this, in our culture, people are mainly known by one name. In other cultures, people are known by many names. I know from my experience teaching in Kenya that my students have their local name they go by, their formal name uh, in their tribe, uh, 
that they got at birth, and then they have a Christian name that may be separate. So they have three different names. So if we consider that, that this kind of culture may have had more than one name someone was known by, they may have had a nickname, their proper name, it's not hard to understand why they might be called by different names in different places. The disciples are Peter, Simon Peter, Andrew, James and John, that are the sons of Zebedee, Philip, Bartholomew, who may also be Nathaniel and John, Thomas, Matthew, also called Levi, James, the son of Alphaeus, who may be the brother of Matthew, which means that if they were both disciples, since he may have been a zealot, this may mean that they were some, in some way reconciled by becoming followers of Christ. Judas, the son of James, or Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot. Another thing that happened in, during the year of popularity is his various teachings and healings. The Roman centurion um, comes to ask Jesus to heal his servant. In Matthew 8, it is a Roman centurion himself. In Luke 7, there's a difference because in Luke 7, the elders of the Jews come and ask Jesus in behalf of the Roman centurion. Now, this is another difference between uh, the way ancient writers did their work and the way we think of things today. This is called a compression, where um, the Roman centurion comes directly in Matthew 8, but um, the elders of the Jews come in Luke 7. So uh, Matthew is simply compressing the story and not talking about the role of the elders. Again, this is the difference. We try to put our Western eyes on an ancient document, and it doesn't quite work. Uh, the uh, Jesus encounters the demoniac in Mark 1 and Mark 4 and 5 he stills the sea uh, Jairus daughter the Jairus' daughter the synagogue uh, ruler um, and the woman with the hemorrhage is there the lame man is in John 5 1 and in this case it shows Jesus power because faith is not even necessary he doesn't even know who Jesus is The Sermon on the Mount also comes during the year of popularity, and he tells the essentials of living in God's kingdom to the disciples. Now, the kingdom of God is both present and future in his sermon. The mission of the twelve comes in Matthew in 10, 5 through 15. He tells them to take nothing. Uh, 16 through 23 uh, seems to allude to a future time. The confession at Caesarea Philippi, that is uh, Peter's confession, um, is a turning point, the hinge on which the Gospels turn. And you can see the passages there where that is documented. The Transfiguration is in Mark 9, 2 through 8. And in it it's important because there are two supreme representatives of the Old Covenant. Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets and they're showing their approval of Jesus' ministry. In the year of opposition, uh, this is where uh, the opposition to him grew to extremes. Causes of the, prop of the opposition, well one is Jesus' view of the law. In Mark 7, 1 through 13, uh, he talks about Corban, which we uh, talked about earlier. That what he's saying is that your practice of trying to uh, look holy by dedicating all your possessions to the temple and in, at the same time, because of the way you've written the rule, you can use it for yourself, but not on your needy parents. You have violated the, the commandment to honor your father and mother. So he really pokes them in the eye. And then in Luke 13, 10 through 17, I think is a good encapsulation, especially the final verse, in this opposition to Jesus. It says um, in verse 10, chapter 13, On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and a woman who was there had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, There are six days for work. So come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, You hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? 
Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for eighteen long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. So the, we see the difference here between the religious leaders and the common people. Um, his, another is that Jesus' view of the religious leaders in Matthew 23, and uh, here he talks about the woes, and this is very hard-hitting. The common misconception of the, of the ministry of Christ is that Jesus was compassionate to everyone. In fact, he was not. He was very harsh on the religious leaders, and I don't think it's because he's being harsh for the sake of being harsh and making a show. I think it's because in harshness, he was trying to help them in the only way they could understand. Um, he says in 23, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing a finger to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be treated in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. Ooh, ouch. Another is Jesus' association with sinners. Uh, they're puzzled by this in Matthew. He associates with Zacchaeus, another tax collector, not just Levi, uh, Levi Matthew. He also associates with a sinful woman. Um, and so his association with sinful people, both men and women, is seen as scandalous. His view of the Jews. Um, he has uh, a ministry to the nations, not just to the Jews. And we see that in Luke 2, 9, 9 through 18. Another uh, cause of opposition is his claims about himself. Uh, he claimed to be eternal. And the people understood that when he said before Abraham was, I am, and that's in the passage in John, he is making himself equal with God. And in general, his, teacher, his teaching simply becomes more biting during this year. Then there is a journey to Jerusalem. Only Luke records this. This is in Luke 9, 51 through 1944. Luke uh, as he says, uses eyewitnesses and servants of the word as he found the information for this. In this passage, Jesus sends out the 72 in Luke 10. Um, and then, chronologically, it appears that uh, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. In the last week, also, there's Palm Sunday. Um, and, um, you know, what were the people expecting? probably a military or, relig or, or political messiah. He comes in a donkey's cult, which symbolizes peace. There is the cleansing of the temple. And then he goes back to Bethany. Monday and Tuesday of the last week, well, there are controversies with the religious leaders. Uh, the Pharisees send a delegation to demand his credentials. Uh, they try to entrap him by uh, discussing paying taxes to Caesar. They also talked to him about the most important commandment. He gives his woes in the last week to the Pharisees. And uh, then there, uh, he talks about the, his own resurrection. The destruction of Jerusalem is predicted, and that's in Matthew 24. On Wednesday, there is the plot of Judas to betray Jesus. He seems to become more alienated. John, in 12.6, um, suggests that, uh, in fact, Judas was motivated by the love of money. On Thursday of the last week, they send Peter and he sends Peter and John to Jerusalem to prepare for the Passover. The Passover meal is recorded by the Synoptics and John. He then goes to the Mount of Olives, that is Gethsemane. Judas then identifies Jesus and betray him, and the disciples flee. Peter tries to defend the Lord in the midst of this, and Jesus heals uh, the high priest's servant's ear. He's then taken to the palace of the high priest, which is Caiaphas. He appears before the Sanhedrin. He is accused of threatening to destroy the temple. The witnesses couldn't agree on their accusations. 
Caiaphas asked him if the, he is the Messiah. Um, Jesus is mocked. Peter denies that he knows Christ. Then on Friday, the Sanhedrin meets to confirm the decision because the law says that decisions can only be made in the daytime. And that's in Mark 15, 1. On Friday, he is accused of leading the nation astray, opposing taxes paid to Caesar, calling himself a king. They couldn't find any charges valid, so he sent to Herod Antipas, who refused to render a judgment because of, of um, his jurisdiction that he was from Galilee. The crowd gathers and asks Pilate for Barabbas. Pilate condemns Jesus. Judas hangs himself. Jesus is beaten. Jesus then is crucified at Golgotha. Seven statements Jesus made from the cross. One is, Father, forgive them. The next is, truly you will be with me in paradise to the thief on the cross next to him. Woman, behold your son when he gives charge of Mary, his mother, to disciple John. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. This is, it is tetelestai, which is an accounting term, which means paid in full. And then, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He's buried by Joseph of Arimathea. Saturday was the Sabbath, so nothing happened on that day. On Sunday, Jesus rises from the dead. And over 40 days, Jesus appears over 10 times from 1 to 500 witnesses. And Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 15:6. The ascension then is 40 days after the resurrection. Now, let's talk about the resurrection for a moment. Some proof of the resurrection. One is the change in the disciples. We talked about this at the beginning of the screencast, that, that uh, after the resurrection, the disciples were actually, or after the crucifixion and the resurrection, both, they were um, hiding in an upper room. At the coming of the Holy Spirit, though, they were empowered and they all died the death of the mar martyr except for John um, preaching what Jesus had taught them and that he was in fact God, that he was the Messiah. Another evidence for the, for the resurrection being real is the very formation and existence of the church and its consistent testimony about Jesus, even when they found to be that embarrassing or when they didn't understand it fully. Now, there have been some people who have posited theories of the resurrection to try to explain it away. One is the swoon theory. And this theory of the resurrection says that Jesus uh, did not, in fact, die on the cross. He was, in fact, crucified. But when he was placed in the tomb, in the coolness of the tomb, he revived from his comatose state. Another exp a way of trying to explain away the res resurrection is theft. That is, the, the disciples simply... Um, stole the body. The third is mass hallucination. That is, the disciples and the 500 witnesses only thought that they saw Jesus. Really, they did not. And the fourth is that uh, when the women went to the tomb in the morning, they actually went to the wrong one. Let's back up now and talk about each one of these. First of all, the swoon theory. The major problem with the swoon theory is this. The Romans who crucified Jesus were professional executioners, and the Gospels record that a spear was actually stuck into Jesus. Uh, they knew dead when they saw dead. He'd been flogged, he'd been crucified, he'd been pierced with a spear, he was dead. The next thing is theft. The problem with theft is that uh, there were Roman guards placed on the tomb, it was sealed, and those Roman guards guarded that tomb at the cost of their own lives. If someone got into it, it they paid with their own lives. So it's uh, really difficult to believe that the disciples were able to overcome them and steal the body. Mass hallucination, well, I don't know what to say about that one. That, that, I think that one's kind of preposterous. The wrong tomb. Well, if the women had gone to the wrong tomb, all the religious leaders would have had to do to shut down the whole Christian thing is to take them to the correct tomb. So, uh, these are the theories that have been used through the years to explain away the resurrection. Let's talk about the teachings of Christ now. Uh, his teaching methods are parables. These are down-to-earth stories with a heavenly meaning. Um, 
It is his most famous method of teaching, and depending on who you talk to or who you read and how they classify a parable, there are about 60 of these. And uh, it's a great way of teaching because people can relate to the earthly stories. Also picturesque speech. He talks about a camel passing through the eye of a needle, a log in the eye. These are examples of his picturesque speak, speech that is actually kind of humorous. His discourses to large groups and to his disciples, these are sort of like lectures, if you will, or sermons. Miracles is another way of his teaching. This is a, the extraordinary intervention of God in history. Uh, it it is, uh, breaches the natural law. These are exceptional occurrences that bring an undeniable sense of the presence of God. And Jesus sees them as a token of a new era. And they were an essential part of his message. And uh, I want you to read Luke 7, 18 through 23, and Matthew 11, 2 through 6. The kingdom of God is another thing he talks about a lot. It consists of God breaking through history to redeem mankind. Um, and his teaching are for those who are in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God and the cross are talked about in Luke 9, 23 and John 12, 24 through 26. He talks about himself as the Messiah. He calls himself the Son of God. Actually, uh, uh, Son of Man is actually the name he preferred the most, though. He forgives sins. Um, and he is one on whom our destiny depends. This is clear in his teaching. He demands absolute loyalty, even more so than the loyalty one would have to their own family. He also talks about the I Am statements. He teaches that he is, in fact, eternal and co-equal with God. He teaches that the Messiah must suffer, in line with the suffering servant poems of Matthew 53. He talks about his baptism, not water baptism, but in this case, in Mark 10, 38, he's referring to his suffering and death. He talks about giving his life as a ransom for many, making the payment for sin once for all. That's an extremely important concept in his teaching, and it really relates to Mark 14, 24, where he reinterprets the elements of the Seder meal and talks about uh, the Last Supper, uh, that that covenant, uh, he reinterprets the element of wine as being the new covenant in his own blood. And one of the things I have supplied in uh, this folder for this week is a chronology of the life of Christ. You don't need to memorize this. I'm not going to ask you to reproduce it on the test, but I thought it might be useful to you to help follow through the life of Christ chronologically as I have presented it in this screencast. All right. The teaching of Christ also, he talks about the triumph of the Son of Man um, in his second coming. Um, his view of the law. Well, this is presented in Matthew 5, 18. Uh, basically, he says this. It will stand as the authority until all is accomplished. In 519, he says, no individual has a right to relax or eliminate the authority of the law. And he says, mere outward obedience to the law doesn't cut it. And to explain what he meant, he reinterprets the Old Testament commandments. The leaders, of, the religious leaders of that day said that if you hadn't actually, for instance, physically committed the act of adultery, you were okay. Jesus says that if you've looked on a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery with you and her with her in your heart. That's a much higher standard. So he takes it to the heart level, not just external behavior. What he gives is really an impossible standard. Uh, and the reason, I think, is that it points us to the need for God's grace, that he's the once-for-all sacrifice for sin.